Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Hi, my name is Vivian Aqua. And first of all, before I say anything, unfortunately, I don't sound like myself and I don't feel like myself. And the reason why is Auntie Rona. I have Rona and um, I spent the whole day in bed. Uh, I'm not going into that, I'm not going into how I'm feeling, but I really wanted to make time and space for this conversation, knowing that, you know, it's already booked and locked and ready. And I did not want to want it to be ruined by Auntie Rona. So um, even though I'm not feeling, you know, wellish, uh, I do, I can talk, I can, you know, hold this conversation because it's important for people to understand that during this Black History Month, we need to realize that I know the black men are out there, but I also want to, as a black woman, I also want to give my support to the black woman in the workplace and really need to understand how we can support them and how we can empower them, not only during Black History Month, but beyond that so that they can work in a safe space, in an environment that they can be themselves and can thrive amongst everybody in the workplace. So for that, I am bringing a few people along and I am going to introduce them uh, properly. So first guest, Citrice Grease. She is a DEI consultant who helps organizations create data-driven, human-centric DEI strategies that drive meaningful change. And uh, Charnette, uh, Shanette is a business clarity mentor that helps entrepreneurs find joy outside of the nine to five to build profitable business. And they are passionate about that. But also another thing that you need to know about Shanette is she recently brought out a children's books, a children's book about uh, the black natural hair. If you have seen my post about, you know, me doubting my braids being welcome in the workplace. Well, this is a pre definition of that and how we should honor the black hair. So thank you ladies for joining uh, joining us today. I call them queens, like we should be called, right? Thank you queens for joining here. And Jackie is joining as well. So let me do a quick, quick introduction for Jackie as well. So um, Jackie Clayton is an acclaimed thought leader and inspirational speaker on recruiting and DEI topics. Currently she serves on the exec team of Textio. Uh, but I also know her from the Inclusive AF podcast, where we had a good, good conversation about DEI and so much more. So thank you all for being here. And I'm really excited about uh, being here today. Uh, like I said, I'm not feeling myself today, but I am doing my best to have this conversation because it's much needed to, to have this conversation. So thank you. Um, let's start with Sir Therese. Why do we need to humanize the workplace? I know that you you have something human centric in your in your uh, bio. So why do we need to humanize it? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's funny you, you mentioned my bio and Mattingly Solutions, my company. Um, that's our vision is to improve the um, workplace experience for one billion employees. Right. So mm. that's we that's our goal. It's everything we talk about. And the reason is because at, we spend most of our adult life in the workplace. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where we spend our time. So it's very important to us as humans, right? To, if this is where we're spending our time, it should be a healthy environment. Um, and it's something that organizations need to remember. Yes, you're a business, but businesses are made up of people. You can't ever forget that part. If you were to take the people out of your organization, you're not going to be running the same. It's not going to look the same. You're not going to be as profitable. So that being said, having that base building block of your humans being in a good place and having their needs met is critical to you being able to succeed. So, you know, you hear all these cases of, oh, should we talk about how it's business or moral? And it's all of the above, you know, it's your business is made up of people. They have personal needs. You got to meet those needs for them to be able to push your business needs forward. I love what you shared. And also, given the fact, you know, we have been talking about the great resignation for a very, very long time now. Oh, and yeah. the fact that now people are taking the time to think, rethink, reflect. Is my job loving me the same way that I'm loving my job? Is my workplace loving me the same way that I'm loving my workplace? Is the team that I'm working in right now, 
is that the ideal team for me to grow and try? Because if that's not the case, let me rethink because now I'm not bounded anymore by find, by looking for a job that is in the same city or the same state. I can work everywhere. So I'm just le- leaving that thought seed, just letting it marinate, soak in for those who are watching and those who are decision makers that if you don't humanize your workplace, think about the great resignation. Shanette, thank you, Citrice. Yeah, I think um, touching on what you just said about the great resignation or the great reset, or some people are saying mm-hmm. the great reshuffle, yeah. Um, what I've taken away from the pandemic era is that people are really refocusing and reprioritizing what's important to them. So like Satri said, we spend the majority of the time at work. But right now, people are basically being able to take a step back and really think about, OK, what's important to me? Is it work or, uh, well, do I need to fit around work or can work fit around me? Mm. So it's like what you were saying, you know, you look at, am I feeling valued? Am I appreciated at work? How is that shown? And I think a lot of people have used that time being at home to really consider, OK, is this right for me? Is this what I want to do with my life? And does this fit with the lifestyle that I've imagined for myself and my family? I think, um, yeah, this is the thing that I, I really I really took on during the pandemic is really thinking about, OK, is the corporate lifestyle for me and my family and how we're set up? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, you're leaving us with a cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just like that, you're leaving us with a cliffhanger. But but just to add on what what Chanette is sharing right now, um, just before the lockdown, I was working somewhere part time, and just before the lockdown, I made a decision to leave that. Why? Because I felt like my values weren't honored, and also I felt, um, let's say that I felt I had to dilute my my wine, right? I'm a fine wine. I had to dilute my wine to lemonade. And eventually the wine was not even lemonade. It was water. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, no, I have to, I have to do something. Also, my passion is about creating a space, creating an environment, helping companies create a space where I would thrive in, but also my son would thrive in. And I want to do that more often. I believe that there is a lot more to be done in the workplace, but I also needed to be real. So mm-hmm. being in the corporate domain for at least 20 years, yes, I'm giving my age away. I'm 41, by the way. I look fabulous, <laughs> 41. Um, but being true that, I know that workplaces, environments can be better. If we work hard collectively, it can be better. So thank you, Chanel, for sharing that. Yeah, just to add on, sorry, I know I said I left it on the cliffhanger, Mm -hmm. but I think it goes back to that sense of, I think corporates have been focusing a lot on diversity. So Mm -hmm. they've been trying to get it diversity, diversity. But the problem is that without the inclusive element, we don't really feel that sense of belonging. And I think that's what a lot of people, and particularly women and black women, struggle in that environment because we don't feel like we belong. It doesn't feel inclusive for us. So therefore, this great reshuffle or resignation or whatever you want to call it, that's part of you trying to find your sense of belonging. And for some, that is at home. And then you anchor that with whatever your passion is. So for a lot of people have taken on kind of like side hustles or just passion projects. And we've seen that really take its course um, throughout the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I tend to keep it simple. So when you are in a kitchen and you're baking the most tasty dish, right? It's good for you to keep the ingredients on the the cupboard, but still having those different ingredients won't take care of the dish you are going to create, right? So if you're not taking care of the oven, the ideal oven temperature that you need to be able to cook your dish, those ingredients will still be sitting there on your table, right? So Mm -hmm. think about that. Think about what you're doing because hiring all these different people to bring it in there and not, not setting the right oven temperature is a waste. I'll hand the mic over to Jackie. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here and meeting new friends. This is a it's a <laughs> great time. I think part of this that we realize I've been working at home for a very long time, but you're seeing people have they've been doing that transition to this hybrid or remote work. And the things that were mine just for me, I then had to start opening it up to other people. Like my kitchen or my living room, my dog, when I get my mail. Um, these are things that started, we started sharing them openly. 
And so you realize I don't have time for that toxicity because this is something <laughs> that I got to s- separate. And yeah. now you're coming into my home. I'm not going to let you do that. And I think that's part of what we're seeing of this, um, like Charnette said, great shuffling, reorganization, or whatever we're, we're calling it. Um, it is understanding that, you know, when I, I need to make sure that my home is still sacred. And so yeah. I don't want to bring a toxic environment into my home. And likewise, I think some people have been um, convinced or, or told uh, feelings of we're a big family, we're a big family. And then we realize we are absolutely not a family right? This is my family. And so we had to keep these these separate. I think it's important to um, recognize the humanity in a community sense. We are a community. We are not a family. Everybody has different roles that we need to work together. Um, but I think the, the main reason why we have to really humanize is that what we realized globally is that the things that we've needed and that we've been asking for and have been refused for so many years mm-hmm. absolutely could make that change when it affected other people. Maybe it didn't just affect me. It affected now it affects everyone. So all of yeah. a sudden we were able to pivot and change and the willingness to do that. And I think part of why we're looking at it is that we we saw how our organizations reacted to this global pandemic or global tragedies. And then we started looking at how they were treating um, people of color, black women, black men, and then the AAPI community. We're seeing how our commun- our companies responded. And it was in tandem at the same time when we couldn't leave the house, we had nothing else to do but watch the news. So we were very paying attention specifically. And unfortunately, that epiphany people had an epiphany moment where they realized, I don't think they care about me. Exactly. Exactly. I I, I talk about where is the love? You know that Black Eyed Peas song yes. where <laughs> after the job honeymoon, so the job honeymoon is somewhere between 90 days or let's say after six months, right? Then you get to see the real deal of the company or of the team. And it isn't that funny or that nice anymore. You're You're starting to see the cracks and and the thing is, will you be staying working there after you have seen it? Or have they lied to you, right? Sometimes they companies are there. They are making it more beautiful. Like, we are diverse. We are inclusive. But then you get in, you're locked up, and realize that mm, this is not what I was looking for. This is not how they sold the dream towards me. So this is a very interesting. My chat has been blowing up. So I need to, I need to give the floor to the people that are, are, are sharing here. So Michael is a, definitely a fan. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for bringing the fire. Um, April is sharing. That's fantastic. Michael is sharing his crown. Roy is a, yes, we are black queens, black sisters. Um, Adiri says awesomeness. Melanie says exciting to join, to listen to you all. Yes, I hope I feel better soon as well. <laughs> And Annalise sharing, totally agree. Diversity should ideally happen naturally. Inclusion and belonging is where the work needs to be done. Yes. And Michael is sharing, yes, the great get out. (laughs) For those of you who don't get it, Get Out is a black horror movie. So if you have seen it, then you'll get it. (laughs) I'm going to steal I'm using that today. Yes, definitely. (laughs) I love that. See what you have done, Michael. See what you have done. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon as well, I think. (laughs) So what can we do to empower Black women? Because I want to start with the things that we can, how we can lift up Black women in the workplace and then expose the yuckiness, yucky things that they they see or they witness. So I'll start with you, Shanette. Where do we need to start? (sighs) Um, okay. How, how, what can we First do? First thing, that's important. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to let that one out. All the trauma from years of just collecting it exactly. within my soul. Yeah, just a big exhale. Um, what can we do? It, there's just so much, but I, I would think there are so many small things that can be done. So I'm going to think on a daily basis, or on a really local level, what companies and individuals can do. From my perspective, when I was in the corporate environment, I think the one of the things that that we need to do is to split out this the sort of woman issue. 
So mm. what we tend to see in, in corporates at the moment is that we're promoting diversity, we're promoting women, we're looking after women, trying to encourage women. But actually what you tend to see is that white women are being um, pushed to the forefront and black women are being, are being held behind. So that's when that whole inter intersectionality conversation comes in. And that's something for a whole deeper conversation. So I think what we need to do is to really just recognize that actually black women have different experiences and we're coming from a completely different place than white women. Yes, we, we can share some of the pains and some of the challenges, but we have like another layer of challenges that comes with being a black woman. And in that environment, we are actually black first, because obviously that's what you see when you see mm -hmm. me. That's how I identify. And culturally, that's that, that's kind of where I belong. So I think it's yeah, just recognizing that we are very, very different to white women, although we do have the same struggles, but we need very specific attention and very specific things. So that's the first easy things. Um, Secondly, I think it was just probably just accepting a black woman for who she is. So let's not thinking that she is all black women. She represents can I, all can I black stop you? women. Yeah. Because there are some people, you know, in the back that yeah. haven't heard that. So if you can repeat what you just shared okay. right now, but just, just to be clear, because my ears are popping and I'm not sure if I heard it. So please repeat it again. I think this one is extremely important for me is just accepting that the black woman mm -hmm. for who she is, that the black woman that's in front of yeah. you and not kind of grouping her into all black women. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we as ourselves already carry that burden of representing all black women, because when we are in those spaces, particularly when we are the only black women, and in most situations, we tend to be the only black person because you tend yeah. not to see men in certain spaces. So it would just be nice to be recognized as being Charnette and not this other black woman and not comparing me to other black people that you've met or whatever. And generally that comparison tends to be a comparison of where they've met another black woman in conflict. And that's something that we always have to come up against because initially the reaction is tends to be, you know, when you're trying to be, you know, assertive, when you're trying to be an expert in the field that you are, the initial reaction is one of either hesitancy or one of like fear or one of just general like combativeness. And um, yes. yeah, I would just say, just accept the person for who she is and get to know that specific black person and try to you know, welcome her into that space. So those are my two really, really small things that I think can make big changes. What I also would like to add on that, and I am going to say this delicately. So um, in certain songs, let's say certain genres, hip hop, rap, or whatever, um, let's say that black women dress differently, right? sometimes not business appropriate and you having that encounter with a black woman thinking that all black women are like that or all mm -hmm. black women are shaking there you know what i mean mm -hmm. is a weird way for upholding that standard i am mm -hmm. not Jeanette, nor am i jackie nor am i Sutrice, nor am i beyonce maybe in my dreams yes i am but in different styles in the workplace no i am not i'm not the other black person and i'm not holding the atlas globe where I have to be responsible for every act that a black person has done. So thank you for mm -hmm. sharing that. Yeah, Jackie. So one thing that uh, I found interesting as I was asked to start speaking more about inclusion in environments mm -hmm. is that the undercurrent was really teach white people how to deal with black people is what Ooh. they wanted to know internally. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that, wait, I'm needing support here. Why am I having to tell this story? You know, and so one thing that I made a, a promise to myself was one, I'm not going to relive any trauma for anybody else's aha moment. Mm -hmm. I will not. You're going to have to accept my words as truth when I tell you that this is happening. I'm not going to relive that. So that is something that it's important because I realized that I was also causing other black women like me to relive that trauma because we have a way it doesn't matter if you were there or not you know that it's happened you felt something yeah. like that so by going through that when you're talking about diversity and inclusion it was a disservice to my sisters in trying to share the the insight and so another thing that i started doing was adding ways of support to black women in those moments of what we're having to deal with, because that's something you haven't seen on the larger scale. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about helping organizations with diversity and inclusion, it always seems to be in that way of it, trying to explain why our worthiness to another group. And so with that, we have to support other women by 
allow and saying you are worthy. This is deserving. You're not being gaslit. Like this is something that's actually real to have that support. So we started adding um, wellness money for people to have their own personal wellness instead of making those determinations. Started offering coaching, started suggesting like mental health, and then started having a environment of, of what I call kind candor so that we can have conversations because I have to be real with you. And that's, I think the other part of what we're seeing where people, um, people will say, Oh, we want you to bring your whole self to work. And I always <laughs> say, you don't want my whole self. My, minus not, that, minus that, minus that, ready. minus that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want all of this. Trust me. Trust me. Um, God's not done with me yet. So, um, yeah. <laughs> but I have to also make sure that we are being supported because I think yeah. so many times in what I hear, people are reliving trauma in order to get somebody else in the majority group to feel comfortable. And that's unnecessary. That's yeah. that's just exploitive. So I've been trying to support Black women through this of these are some of the things that I hear as someone who works in diversity and inclusion from a corporate standpoint and understanding also with organizations where their levels are to have that understanding of what they're going to do and what they're not going to do and how and allow you to make that determination if you want to continue to your relationship with organizations. Um, so being transparent in that moving forward, but also um, like this month we were working on Black History Month, not everything had history. We were making history last week, right? There's things that have, have been a part of that. And so um, making sure that people are realizing that things are happening now and supporting women that are a part of making history now is something else that we are looking at to bring it to be more realistic, to be supportive, because we have a lot to be proud of. Um, and so I think it's important that we remind ourselves uh, and remind others and support each other in that way. That's been something that I've noticed that's just a pet peeve where I'm like, wait, what about me? I feel like you're not, this, this conversation that you want me to have is to try to explain, to teach you how to, to, to accept me. But how about me walking into this environment where I'm one of two Black women? H how am I supposed to deal with that? Yeah. That's the always, it's still, you know, unironic. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's unironic, but it still happens. That's what you yeah. see in these programs. And so... It, it being inclusionary doesn't mean, oh, we're going to allow you to be here. It should mean you need to accept me as I am and not try to change who I am. Because if you cause me, if you ask me to change who I am, I'm not going to change who I am. I'm going to change where I am. And that's what we're seeing, I think, throughout the distance. Right A song that pops up right now is from Mary J. Blige, Take Me As I Am or Have Nothing At All. And also another thing that you tapped into um, I got to a point that I was done talking about what happened to me because it's not easy to talk about uh, past trauma. And it's also, I have been to therapy, to being to coaching. I don't want to open up Pandora's box to satisfy somebody else. But what I'm happy to talk about is luckily there are tools, there are different ways for people to really go through that experience without you sharing your experience over and over again. And for those who don't know it, on, on my LinkedIn profile, you'll see in the future section, you'll see uh, a, a YouTube video about Amplify Empathy. That's a good way for you to, for the people that don't know what it means to be other, don't know what kind of microaggression, the invisible part, right? A lot of people don't realize there are so many different signals that one person is sending out. And the, the levels of microaggression that, you're not seeing because you are a bystander or you're not noticing because you're not a person of color. It reaches beyond. Within five minutes, 20 things, more than 20 things are happening and you're not noticing this. But what if I can give you that experience for you to relive it as a real experience, not a cartoon, but as a real experience for you to walk in my shoes for five minutes and see what I see, maybe feel what I feel. And then we can have a conversation about, okay, now we are up to par because us sharing our story, you don't know if our story marinates with that person. You don't know if it clicks with them. And with this, it can accelerate the learning. And then maybe then I feel comfortable with 
sharing maybe a snippet of what I felt because I really want you to reach a certain level before I can open my heart or open up what I've been through uh, again. So thank you for sharing that. So Therese. Yeah, I want to start by tying back in what Charnette was discussing earlier in regards to organizations have typically prioritized the focus on diversity, right? And I know there was a comment about mm -hmm. it as well. And I, I want to give a quick definition how I think of the three. Um, and so diversity is how we see each other. Inclusion mm -hmm. is how we treat each other. And yeah. equity is how we uplift those who have historically been left behind. And so I'm going to touch on those last two for a minute. When it comes to equity, that's how organizations can empower women, right? It's Black women. It's what are our policies, procedures at that org level that are out there and how are they impacting them differently and how can we improve that? Inclusion those are behaviors. And that is what you as an individual in your organization, doesn't matter your role, your title, anything, what behaviors you can do. And once you have that equity and inclusion, that's going to lead to increased diversity. And all three of those together leads to belonging, which is feeling valued, respected, seen, and heard. So that's how that picture all comes together. Um, and then the one thing I wanted to add as well to tie in what all three of us have been thinking and where my mind went as well is this, this concept of individuality, right? Mm -hmm. So, so often, um, when people have these conversations, they want to, for instance, I'm an ally to the black community. Well, like you were saying, what does that mean? I am not the same as every other person in this community. So saying that, it doesn't mean anything, it's empty words. It's you just trying to make yourself feel good. What you need to do is get it down to that individual level. So how can you empower a black woman? Ask them. Go mm. talk to that person, build a relationship, right? So don't go ask some random black woman on the street. A professional you, relationship, you, though. Right? Like, you, you need one. To, exactly, exactly. Don't just walk up to any black woman and say, you look like you need some help. What can I do for you? <laughs> no, it's, it's about going in your workplace, reaching out to someone who is different than you, and yeah. getting to know them on a personal level. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, once they are comfortable with you, because again, we don't want to be opening doors that they're not comfortable talking to you about. But once you have that relationship, then saying, hey, I want to be able to support you. What can I do? What do you need? Did you know this? Like, where, what are your goals in the organization? OK, those are your goals. Here's some resources. Did you know those exist? Have you met, met this person? And giving them those doors, but starting at that individual level making sure you know their specific needs and you have that relationship and then the action, right? Getting past is asking them, oh, I want to know these things about your community. That doesn't help them. That is still only helping you. So I want people to move beyond this awareness phase that we've been in. It's great. It's important to know these things exist and to learn about others. Sure. But if you really want to help, if you really want to help, turn it back to them. What are let's, you doing for those women? Let's, let's add a little pepper sauce to what you're saying yeah. right now. So I want you, I want to challenge everybody who is from the majority. So the white men, the white woman, I want to challenge yourself. What steps are you taking to become a sponsor for the other, for the other black woman? What steps are you doing? Because mentoring, uh, I'm done with mentoring. We need to accelerate our, our career growth. We need to accelerate our growth. And to be able to do that, we need authentic, listen, authentic sponsorships to see ourselves in the boardrooms, to see ourselves in the senior level management, to see ourselves there. Because when you look around in certain positions, we're there at entry level. We might be a little bit there in medium level, but when it goes higher, upper, you know, higher and higher up the tier, who is missing? Who's missing at the table? People have been blowing up my chat. So I really need to address that. Um, it's me, myself and I peeps. So. <laughs> Let me let me cover this. So love the wine, lemonade and water and the other. Yes. Uh, one thing that you should know, I talk about food. So when I do those things, I do address food. There has been some carrot cake here and there, some barbecue here and there in this whole d &I space. So, yes, Amara is sharing. Great to be here. Yay, Amara. Michael is sharing. Yay. And Capri is sharing. Speak on it. And Michael is sharing, and also don't confuse you with the other black woman in the office. Yes, yes. Allowing every individual to be their authentic self. It sounds so simple and yet so right. Yes. 
Um, yes, Charnette. And what is racial trauma? Yes, this is a hefty one. This is definitely a hefty one. And here is Cheryl Browner. She's sharing great podcast equality, diversity, inclusion is sustainable only if employers actually implement the actual equality, uh, diversity and inclusion, not the percent. I do want to say I'm more of a equity person because the diversity and the inclusion is, is are, people are trying to do that. The equity part is where somebody who has special abilities is having is using a different bike, right? You don't know about me, but I'm very tall. I'm one meter 86 or so six foot one, I guess. I need a different bike than the standard bike. And that's why we need to, we need to think about what do you need to accelerate your career as well? Amara sharing, do the work yourself, yes. Time to level up the game. Uh, Chess is sharing, in all corporate jobs I've worked, never to understand the truth of equality, diversity, equity, and diversity and inclusion. Yes, we need to challenge people. And Amar is sharing, what's really annoying is senior manager pretending to get it. Well, Amar, <laughs> your words, I'm only emphasizing it. <laughs> yes, and... Uh, Dr. Victoria shared, yes, we must move all beyond awareness to intentional action. So Satrice, so preach. And Jared, yes, our friend, make sure my video match my audio action matter of the words. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jared, for being here as well. So getting back to uh, the question, because um, one of you talked about the doubles, the only doubles, right? So I'm going to have this conversation where the tokenized employee, aka the onlys or the double onlys. You all know what I mean. Jackie, can you elaborate on this one? Because I think it was you who shared something about being the only one or the only Yes, two. it has happened a lot. Um, so my background, I am um, VP of talent acquisition now, and there's a multiple people, but because my background has been in technology in this space and in HR tech um, and working as a recruiter in technology, then there was a lot of times I was the only one. I would be mm. the only black woman, sometimes the only woman in various environments. And what is interesting is that people, especially when you're the only, it's almost like you're invisible. Yep. Like they don't keep those things in the consideration. Um, and when you're looking at, at it's a, it's a lonely place to be. Uh, as I've gotten older, I'm 48. I know you thought I was <laughs> Fabulous. younger, but um, uh, when I, when I started volunteering to be as tribute, where I was like, mm -hmm. I, will go into spaces where I don't think I'm supposed to be, <laughs> where it's going to be hard to try to make space um, for others. Like you were saying, you were talking about your son specifically, but I, I think about my children, but then I also think about just who's coming after me in those, yeah. in those spaces and trying to be intentional. And I think that we have to be intentional um, about making spaces and creating a culture for people that are coming after us. I don't know if everybody is ready. We're starting to see things moving forward. Um, but I think that we have to help. But as we're working, we have to help other other black people, black women, specifically, that's what we're, we're discussing today, of making those spaces and developing the culture um, and not letting it go so that we can make spaces for other place, other people. And then as someone who's in talent acquisition, it makes it nicer to start talking to other black women about bringing people in because we are working on this. We are doing the things. Um, but I think, I hope that people find their, their worthiness. And as you're, as people are shuffling, that they notice if, if you find yourself in that uncomfortable position, there are a lot of people that want to hire you <laughs> and, and nurture you and be there. Um, and so we just have to start asking the right questions of, I think of before it was, what do you think about like, isn't diversity, inclusion, you know, and belonging important to your organization? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Now we need to know, tell me what you've done in the last year. How has this played out? Who is responsible for it? And what is the accountability factor? And who do I go to? I've added this and started coaching people that I mentor in every inter interview. Just ask, if I feel like I'm being discriminated against, what is the process? And who do I reach out yeah. to to get the problem solved? Not in anticipation of something going wrong, 
but there should be an easy answer in case it comes up for anyone, not just you, anybody who is marginalized, an organization should be able to tell. And it shouldn't be, oh, you just reach out to HR because these are serious issues to figure out if you're going to be protected or not. Right. Yeah. And so, um, yes, I've been in I've been in that place. It's been a very lonely place through the years. I'm no longer in that place. Um, but I, I think that right now is it if you if you're thinking about making that change now is the time i would say there's so many open positions if you have and if not if you can't because it's that a privilege. encouraging people yes i am <laughs> Lise, why people ask me all the time what should i do if my company said they're going to do this what should i do yeah. leave yeah yeah true you true. should leave and get a you should trust your gut on that because if you have seen, you know, if they had sent something and it doesn't match and it's it's treating you in a worse way, why are you staying in a bad relationship, right? A work relationship. Why are you staying? So one of the things that you shared, I want to talk about because recently in the Netherlands, we are dealing with a whole Me Too where The Voice of Holland, you have a similar program, The Voice, where it it, it has come to light that uh, let's say that people in power have misused their power for inappropriate behavior. And now different companies, different people at the, at the top are being uh, exposed for this whole Me Too. And one of the things that I asked recently was, if something happens within your company that is that concerns inappropriate behavior, do you know what to do, where to go? Do you know who you can talk to so that it's being taken care of, right? And a lot of people shared, like 40% shared that they don't know where to go. And this worries me because what if something happens? And what if somebody's standing next to your desk explaining that such and such has happened and it's inappropriate? The way you treat the victim, it's very important here. Don't go saying, no, Peter, Peter didn't do that. No. Listen to them and find out what you can do to support them and report it elsewhere. Don't go, don't go defending something because it's already a challenge for somebody to share something that is so hard and so difficult to share. Believe them and then sort out the rest. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Jackie. So, Therese. Yeah, no, I... <sighs> To tokenize, right? And I actually want to lean into the comment that was made about senior management pretending to get it, right? And let's mm -hmm. let's think positively for a moment and think they really, yep, that one. Let's think maybe they actually think they get it, right? Mm -hmm. But they're missing the mark. And I think yeah. that's what happens a lot when it comes to tokenized employees is it, there, it can be well-intended, but not, not having the impact. And so they're like, oh, we have one, right? <laughs> Woo, we did it. There's, there's only eight of us, so having one is good, right? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, well, or leaning into that one person, like, oh, we want to make sure, you know, that we're covering our bases. What in, like we said, that representation, you're, you're here, what do you think about? And just really pushing into that. And so what I think is really important is finding that balance because they're not completely wrong, right? I'm going to say it as black women, I don't want somebody else always just assuming they know what I need or cover, like, you know, speaking for me on my behalf. And so it's important for us to have our voices heard and to be at that table. However, you got to find that line of, are you just pulling me in in this moment because I'm black? You know, I had a situation once where um, a client came and said, you know, I not not here at my only solutions, but a client came in and was like, oh, we want a diverse like consultant. And so my bosses came and they were like, well, <laughs> you're our option. So you're on this client. And it's like, I mean, yes, but also like, did you really want me there? Do you really believe in me? Does the client believe in me? Are you like, this is our black woman. She can do it because she's diverse, you know? So finding that line of how are you uplifting people versus tokenizing them. And one of the ways I think that you can find that is being sure to check in, you know, and say, hey, I want to ask you this. I don't want to err. I want to err on the caution of not tokenizing you. Is that okay? And that goes back to what I was saying before about having those safe relationships or like a psychologically safe environment. If you've heard people talk about that, that psychological safety is so key 
because you can ask that question, but that woman, like I would need to, in that scenario, have been able to say, actually, no, this makes me uncomfortable that you're coming to me. And it does feel like you're just using me for my race right now and not for my abilities. So while I appreciate the offer, I don't know that this feels like a good fit, you know? So, and so besides, that's a lot and besides that, there, but... there are three beautiful B and I coaches that you can pay, invest, and ask them questions appropriately, yeah. right? Don't go assuming that the only black candidate in the workplace mm -hmm. is supposed to be transformed in the new DEI coach. They already have a challenge to do their job. And then on top of that, be a representative on the whole DEI domain? No. Right. Right. So yeah. Thank you for sharing. Jeanette. <laughs> Yes. Um, we're talking about tokenism, right? And being the only. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think um, I'll just probably piggyback a little bit on what Satrice said about basically um, uh, just assuming that the black candidate is going to be everything for you. So they're going to be their role. Then they're also going to be the representative, as you say, for DNI. Then they're also going to be the rep for other things. And they're always being challenged to do more outside of their traditional role yeah. without the support. And I think um, also maybe Satrice had um, touched on this before, but it's being able to have lots of different um, safe areas or safe people to speak to. So I think where you find a lot of challenges is where you have um, situations where your manager or your direct manager is also your appraiser. They're also supposed to be your mentor. They're also then supposed to be your sponsor. And then they're also the HR contact for the, for the department. So most people feel a bit under pressure. They don't really know who to go to or who, who, who to find for support. So I think where I've seen it work well is where you know, you've got your buddy or you've got your mentor, but you also have that sponsor and they all have a specifically different role for you within that firm. And I think in terms of um, progressing your career and actually pushing forward, that's where your sponsor really comes in because they can really speak your name in those rooms where you're not currently there. They can mm -hmm. open the door for you and they can basically help you to network across the firm outside of your department and outside of what you're working on. Whereas your mentor is someone that's really going to help you with your, OK, what checks, what do I need to tick off to make the next um, promotion? But your sponsor is a person that's going to be like, well, hey, actually, there's so much more to this than just ticking off these boxes. You need to basically be visible. You need to be seen as a leader. You need to be someone that the firm thinks that can grow business, can maintain business. So you need to have someone there to help you with your day-to-day -day tick box exercise job, but also someone that's preparing you for your future leadership role. And um, what I generally find is when you are the only one, unfortunately, you do get overlooked. You get forgotten about a little bit because they feel that they've ticked their kind of diversity box. And especially if you're a black woman, they've ticked two at once. And oh, if you're, <laughs> if you're a mother, oh, great, win, win. Tick three. And then if you come back from maternity leave, oh, there's just juicy, you know, four boxes in one, we're done. <laughs> yeah. So I think looking beyond all of those tick box exercises and really, again, going back to that person and really setting really strong um, objectives, clear goals, what do they want to achieve? What can they achieve within their role and you know and asking the question are you ready for a new challenge what can I do to help you you know push up a little bit more okay I see you've not done this actually here's an opportunity here and um, yeah I find if you're the only one you tend to get overlooked for those opportunities really I am so glad that you touched upon this because um, we now live in a day and age where it's easier to connect with women or to connect with other people, right? Mm -hmm. You have LinkedIn, you have Twitter, you have so many spaces where you can feel safe. So what I'm trying to say is if you cannot find that safe space where you can have that conversation, where you can find your mentor, where you can find a sponsor, don't worry. There are other spaces where you can find them, reach out to them, be authentic though, because if you're just here for the clickbait and just, you know, want to just get information and run, be authentic as well and reach out to this person why you want them to be your sponsor or why you see them as your mentor and from go from there on. I, I started my career at the end of 90s. I did not have this. So I felt alone mm -hmm. and I felt... Um, it activated my imposter syndrome in a huge way. And it also made me delude myself, right? In the beginning, I was talking about the fine wine that I am, but I'm not lemonade. Even though my last name is water, I don't want to be like transparent like water. I want to be <clears throat> me. I want to be as mm -hmm. purple, as bubbly, as spicy as me. And that doesn't happen when you have to delude yourself to be able to fit in or to be able to work. And that 
is a no go. That is a no go. So thank you for yeah. sharing. And I think I was just going to add on to to what you just said in terms of the sponsor. Oh, you you muted yourself in terms of the sponsorship, <laughs> and then <laughs> sorry. No, in terms of finding a sponsor, um, you know, don't necessarily go with the first person that offers themselves to you. Exactly. Right. Be very clear mm -hmm. about their intentions yeah. and actually what's driving their decision to be a sponsor. Like, mm -hmm. Are they actually really here to help you? Are they also ticking their checkbox exercise to make MD or to become an ED? So I would definitely recommend that people interview, you know, prospect your sponsors first. You know, find people who, who kind of present themselves, have the similar values that you are doing well, that you look up to, and then interview interview them in a way really find out you know what their values are what's driving them and figure out whether or not they're the right person for you when I was working a few years ago I also went through this process where you know my firm at the time were um, bringing in mentoring programs for non-Dutch speakers uh, or for non-Dutch people so that was basically all the um, economic migrants or people who were born here but are you know brown or people of color and um, yeah I was also going through looking for my sponsors and I narrowed it down to three people and the one guy that I thought would be my most amazing sponsor actually was the worst and I'm so glad I, I really sat down and had an interview with him and a coffee because really one of the first things that came out of his mouth for me which really rung alarm bells was um, I'm not really sure why this is uh, why people are doing this because actually the, the people that are most um, challenged in our firm are white men and I'm thinking okay there are so many things that we can really talk about here <clears throat> but the gaslighting um, it took my face <laughs> was just something that I'd never really, uh, I don't know, it never happened to me before. So again, really kind of understand these people's motivations. Why are you doing this? What, you know, what's behind your need to support me or to sponsor me? Um, and in some cases, yeah, it's, it's not really for you, it's for them. Yeah, I, that last thing that you <laughs> Sorry, shared mic was, uh, <laughs> again, a mic drop. <laughs> I wanted to share some of the comments as well and then end, end the session. So Capri sharing, I'm so sorry, Capri, it happened to me. No one helped me while when I reported discrimination. I hope that during this conversation, you have learned some tips and tricks, what you can do and ask ahead where you can go for some support. Uh, believe them. Yes. No arguing. Yes, definitely. Amplifying your our voice. We need to do that starting from today as well and michael is sharing purple pepper with you <laughs> thank you all i want to end on um this note what is your what are your three words that you're taking away after this conversation and i'll start with satrice Ooh, i was real distracted because i wanted i wanted to pull up the title of this book that um i'd love for i'd love for you to check out um that can also help you with that and it's called um hush money how one woman proved systemic racism in her workplace and kept mm. her job it's by jackie abram it's really good i listened to the audiobook it was beautiful but the paperback is good there's a book two now and so um she details um it's fictional but she details what she went through um essentially and it gives all these things but basically long story short keep your receipts <laughs> mm, <laughs> if something's definitely. happening and you are not like you think you're experiencing something just keep all the information you can to support you um this, down is, the this line. is a new book right i've read something about this that she was writing this because her daughter or so was going to something similar right yeah well so, so she's got something going on right now that mm -hmm. um, involving her daughter for sure but yeah i just looked and it came out in october um of 2020 the first one her second one that one just came out i'm not sure exactly when mm. um, but yep that's that's the book definitely definitely recommend um black women to read it because i'm sure you'll be able to relate and then others to read it as well because it gives you some insight you know into what one what people go through and two you're like okay this is how i could support them um later on so but yeah i think as far as um you know some words i'm taking away today um I mean, really, it's two that are standing out. So I'm gonna break your rules a little bit, but it's the individuality and an mm. action. You know, so making sure we are making those personal connections. Don't make blanket statements, um, and then getting away from this just education and awareness. And we are acting. So yeah, those are those are my two. <laughs> Hope that's alright. Thank you, thank you, Shanet. I think uh, my three words are for the black woman in the corporate mm -hmm. space is just to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, find your tribe, 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, I don't know. The third is quite difficult. I don't know. Let me think me. I don't know. Just be, I don't know, be proud or just be, your, not be, be yourself as much as you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Jackie. You know, I'm not good at this, Vivian. You were on our <laughs> podcast. It's like three things. Um, I think what stood out, and, it, and you kind of touched my heart when you were showing one of the comments. One of the people that had made a comment was there. I'm not going to cry, I promise. Um, was the person who was there for me when I was the only one. Mm. When I was the only Black woman and supported me through that. And so I think right now we're finding a lot of performative allies. Um, look for real allies out there. I I will never forget that during a time when I was feeling really alone, um, they gave me a gift, but they didn't just give me a gift. It was like coffee because they knew I loved coffee, but it was also from a black um, uh, producer of coffee. Like Mm -hmm. it just thought I was thinking about you and it was like, brought it all. It's very thoughtful. She used to have me cry all the time because it was be difficult and be like, I'm thinking about you and I know, how can I support you? So look for real allies and keep and and I think the big piece is just keep going because yeah. you are are worthy and you don't have to stay in the space where you are. If I can ever be of assistance, if you connect with me on LinkedIn um, and connecting you with other recruiters to help you find places, because I yes, I am an advocate of the great resignation where I'm like, quit, leave, <laughs> don't stay. Um and it's not from a bad place. It's because I, I care about you and I want yeah. you to be your best. So um, I just think keep going and you're worth it. You're worth it. What I take away from this conversation, first of all, you three are amazing women. And thank you for speaking your truth. But also thank you for inspiring so many other women or uh, women and people in general to do better, to treat black women better. So that's one. The other thing is I want us, I want the black women to see our true value. We are a diamond in the rust. We are already resilient and we have so many things going on, but also realize, I know that we are strong, but at the end of the day, we are also human. So we cry, we bleed, we hurt the same way as other people do. So don't see don't go saying that a black woman is strong thinking that we can take like 10,000 punches. I get bruises as well. And I want you to treat me as human. I want you to see me as the same person who is being treated. I want you to respect me as such. And I want you to uplift me as such. So that's the other thing. And the last thing that I'm taking away is I want us to speak up for ourselves. So If you're not thriving in the workplace, hustle it up. You can build up your own business and do something else. Do something that you love and that gives you a lot of passion, a lot of heart, because we are not built to die slowly in the workplace. That's it. So thank you all for watching this conversation. And until next month. Bye, everybody.